I got a very nice email um, uh, about a week ago from someone saying he didn't agree with what I've been saying about how I think we're going to win, particularly this idea of there being a state collapse, but that we would still be able to maintain order and uh, prevail that way. Now, he sent me this gentleman. I don't name him here. Uh, he'll know who he is. I've emailed him to let him know that I, I've done this video. Um, but he, he sent me five questions, well, really six questions, and I want to go through them now. So I want to answer his email by means of this video. So I think it's a pretty good email. It was nice of him to do it. He did it courteously and nicely. So here goes. The first question he asks is, where is the money coming from that will be offered to repatriate those who want to leave or those we want to leave, potentially millions of people? Now, I think that's a very good question. Um, as I've said before in a previous video entitled Paid Repatriation, I don't think we can afford to pay people to leave. I don't think we've got the money. I think the uh, uh, the average wage in this country is £30,000 a year, plus all the welfare benefits. I just don't, I think it'll be too expensive to entice people to leave by paying money. I don't think we'll want to do it. I don't think we'll have the, I don't think we'll be able to do it. I don't think we'll have the money to do it. Uh, what I think is going to make foreign populations repatriate themselves out of our land voluntarily is the unlivable conditions that they will find themselves in if uh, the state breaks down and uh, populations separate out along ethnic lines, which is what I think will happen. If that happens, then I think those foreign areas within our land will become unlivable and very unpleasant, wretchedly unpleasant, fast, without gas, electricity, phone, broadband, healthcare, maybe even water or drainage. And that's what I mean by unlivable. Now, if, or I would say when the system breaks down, then I think that will be accompanied, or that will very soon see a radical separation out of populations along ethnic lines. So, uh, and, and that, that, that's not necessarily a matter of um, racism or prejudice. That might simply be a, a question of, uh, um, just a question of how you live your life or practical finances. Who w will you, if you are English and you live amongst English people in an English area, are you prepared to pay more to keep that area running in order, and if, you, if you're having to, 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 to vote with your feet as to what area you join, are you going to pay more to join an area that has uh, more highly criminalized people and uh, more poverty stricken people in it, which the non-English populations tend to be? There is no incentive, there will be no incentive for you to, uh, to want non-English populations within your area. And there'll be a feedback loop on the back of that because the more English people separate themselves out from foreign areas, or the more the, the, the two the, the populations, English and non-English populations separate themselves out, the more unpleasant it will be for a few politically correct English people to live amongst non-English people because they'll find themselves hugely outnumbered. So I think you'll get a radical a very hard separating out of populations along ethnic lines. And um, and the non-English areas, I think, will become unlivable fast. And that, I think, will be the main incentive for um, foreign populations within our land to want to repatriate themselves voluntarily. Now, where I think money might come from in order to subsidize or to pay people to repatriate themselves is simply from business people, from business businesses, speculators, looking at the land within foreign areas and saying, we will buy that land from you. That territory, the territory, the land within non-English areas will be much more valuable to a British, an English businessman than to the foreigners living in it because an English but the English are a productive trading creative people we will do a lot more with that land than the foreign population say our Muslim population will do with it particularly if that area is in free fall if the conditions within it are entirely are destitute and poverty stricken and that land will pass from the low bidder to the high bidder as is always the case and the way I would envisage that happening is an English businessman approaching the owner of territory, 
within a foreign enclave and saying, I will buy a block of your territory, here's some money, you can live like a god on that money in your ancestral homeland, take it, it's the best offer you're going to get, you can now leave, your, cir your circumstances are unlivable, so take the money and go and give me vacant possession of that land. That I think will be a financial incentive for people to leave. And I don't think they will need much of a financial incentive if the conditions are impossible within their territory. Now, I've, I've done a video about this. Uh, it's entitled Islam in England, far, number five, the likely resolution. You can look at it for it on my channel. Now, I don't think this just applies to Muslim populations, but to pretty much um, all non-English or, or to non-English populations in general within our territory. Okay, now the second question is, do you really think the country's international airports and air traffic control, etc., will be operating in a country with no functioning government and a worthless currency? If so, give some details on how that would work, starting with how the pilots would get paid. Well, good question. I agree. If we were to fall into some situation of post-Holocaust chaos, then airports and air traffic controllers wouldn't function because airports and air tra traffic controllers don't function in circumstances of post-Holocaust chaos. But I don't think that's going to happen. The mistake that I think that question makes, the assumption that it is based on, is that the only way of providing order, of providing law, of providing a functioning uh, uh, um, society is under the force, the compulsion, the coercive force of the state. No, wrong answer. I don't think that's the case. I think the current system, the current state system will break down. I think it will collapse. But I think we can still live our lives and prosper if, and this is the crucial point, if we are able to maintain law, if we can retain law. Now, if the state breaks down, people won't be able to provide their, to, to meet their primal need for law from the state because the state won't be able to provide it because the state will have broken down. So I think people will look to meet that need, that need for law. They will look to meet that need privately through private sources. Now, it's a, a mistake that a lot of, quite a few snobbish and stuck up lawyers make to think that the law is something that this elite, this class elite impose on a reluctant and, and ignorant bulk of the population who don't want it, but it's for their own benefit. No, and that's not the case. People need law like people need shelter. It is a basic human need. And if the state breaks down, people will look to private sources of law. And to that end, I've written a private legal code that you can find on my website. I'll leave a link down below. If circumstances come to that, you're welcome to use it. Now, the bottom line is, if we retain the law, we can keep living and earning and trading and creating an orderly, prosperous society. And a functioning, orderly, prosperous society is able to keep airports open. Now, question number three. You talk about English people still being able to trade and be prosperous in a situation without the state and after an economic collapse. With what currency? The pound will be worthless and therefore useless. This problem applies to one and two, questions one and two also. Okay, as regards currency, it's another, this seems, this question seems to be based on the mistake that money is wealth, that money is value. No, money and currency, the, 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 um, this is just a, a token, it's a measure of wealth, a measure of value. It's, a, it's a, a form of liquidity, a token of exchange. Now, if one form of currency breaks down, people will find another form of currency, another form of liquidity that they can use. I, I, I think people will simply ref, uh, revert to the age-old reliable means of exchange, which is gold and silver, or um, more accurately, notes. Uh, which are backed by gold and silver, which represent gold and silver. So you exchange notes in order for goods. And this is what we had for centuries. It was a stable situation. It saw us through the, the Industrial Revolution and the Victorian era. We, we did pretty well out of that. I think people will revert to that. 
Um, some people say we'll revert to cryptocurrency. I don't think that's the case. It might happen. I could be wrong there. I'm not in a position to offer financial advice. I'm certainly not going to do so. But um, the point I'm making is that although I think the state will break down, I don't think that means that society and the entire economy needs to break down, particularly if, and I say it again, if we are able to maintain and retain law, because law is what enables us to live together safely and to cooperate and crucially to trade together and to produce, to create wealth and value. The state currency is not the be all and end all. That is a mistake. Now, question number 4A, question number 4 is split into two. So 4A, you talk about collectivizing for law and order, but never give any details. Give me a rough outline of how such a system would work and with no functioning state. For instance, how do we punish guilty culprits, operate private prisons, or just give them a flogging? Well, actually, I have given plenty of details. I did a, a series of videos on this uh, entitled How We'll Win. If you look particularly the fifth one, How We'll Win number five, that does give details. Now, um, just to explain it here, I think the kind of system that will prevail is a system of law of legal codes that operate like a club or like some mutual insurance policy. So, yeah, so let's say the state breaks down. I might come forward and say, here, I've got a legal code, I've developed it, and it's also backed up by um, the enforcement mechanism, courts, judges, bailiffs, prisons, and, and policemen. You have to pay a subscription in order to join, but when you join, you are then able to be trusted. People will trust you to be able to, to, they will allow you to live near them because they know if you commit a crime, you can be punished. So they will trust you to live near you because you've submitted yourself to a system of law. Also, it will enable you to, to trade, to do business, to, to have a bank account, to be, to be employed. Because again, if you break your contract, if you break your word, people will be able to sue you. There's a set of rules that you've submitted yourself to. There's a court that people can sue you in. And I think that is perfectly um, doable, that's perfectly possible under a private, a private system, a private system of law. As regards um, punishment, or, uh, as regards punishment, simply being excluded from that is likely to be punishment enough. People need to show that we need to show that we have submitted ourselves to a system of law uh, in order to be able to trade, to be able to, to, to make money, to feed ourselves, to be able to live near other people. In the medieval era, one of the most extreme forms of punishment was to be um, to become an outcast, an outlaw, to be pushed beyond the bounds of the city, beyond the bounds of the law, where anyone could prey on you and you, you weren't able to um, to deal with other people. So, and you became poor and the likelihood is that you, you would starve. So I would expect a system, uh, the sort of system that, that I'm describing, to be very intolerant of people who join it and who so voluntarily join it and say, I will submit myself to the rules of this system, but who join it simply in order to break those rules and commit crimes against other members. And the way I would see it working is you join and you say, I will observe and obey the rules of this system in this code in my dealings with other members of this system and this code. If you join it voluntarily and then you break those rules and commit crimes against other members of that, that, um, that, that system, I think they're going to be very intolerant of that and they're likely to want to punish you. As, to, as, as regards other forms of punishment, well, you can think of those for yourselves. I would have thought the kind of punishment that would prevail then is, in those circumstances, is forced labour. You get carted off. Let's say I burgle your house and I smash the window, damage the carpet and steal your telly or your widescreen TV and maybe that's five grand's worth of damage. I then get carted off and I have to spend a couple of years stuffing envelopes for a pittance until I'm able to, to raise, until that makes five grand, which then compensates you for the damage that I did and puts it right before I can be released. And then I might not be allowed to go back into the system because I now have a criminal record. And then what do I do? I'm an outcast. That is probably likely to be a pretty healthy deterrent that's going to make me want to uh, to obey the law, to observe the rules that I've signed up to. Now, uh, question 4B. 
Trying to punish a Muslim will lead to a civil war between us and them. You know their gang mentality and propensity for violence. They don't accept the law of the kuffar as it is. Do you really think they'll accept that we have the right to punish one of theirs? We'd have hundreds of them on our territory fighting in no time. A civil war would result. Okay, my response to that is that I see no prospect whatever of civil war between Muslims or any non-English group and the English, unless Muslims were to come to have some majority over us of two or three to one, which I, I don't think is going to happen before the system breaks down. If you think Muslims, uh, Muslim enclaves are likely to be a formidable opponent, then simply Google why Muslims lose wars. You get nearly 10 million results from that, that Google search, and some of them are quite interesting. If, again, if you don't believe me, visit any Muslim enclave in this country and ask yourself, how sustainable is this area? How self-sustaining will it be if it is cut off and isolated from the English areas, the English population that provides all of the all of the amenities again gas electricity drainage and water or um, communications telephone and broadband those areas will become wretched fast i don't know how an area survives without a good water supply without a good drainage supply even if we didn't have the army on our side which i think the army will choose sides even if we didn't have the army i would expect those Muslim areas, those Muslim enclaves, of having to, to have as much chance of waging civil war against us as a vole would have of waging war against your farmyard cat. I, I'm not sure what the need would be to punish people in those circumstances, how that need would arise if Muslims prey on each other, commit crimes against each other within an Islamic enclave, that's not our business. I don't think it's my business. And I would, I, there are areas where I would want to punish some Muslim people, and that is where they've committed civilizational crimes against us, particularly the rape gangs, the members of the Islamic rape gangs. I think it is necessary to punish them, to exact a crushing retribution against them. Firstly, to show that, um, to deter them doing that again. Secondly, to show, to mark our own displeasure and to show the firmness of our resolve and our determination to protect our own English citizens against those kind of depredations. But first, thirdly, and I think most significantly, those crimes, the rape gang crimes, are civilizational crimes. When you have a civilizational crime committed against you, you have to show the rest of the world what you do to the perpetrators. I think it is necessary to punish those perpetrators, those rape gang members, severely so that future civilizational enemies that we don't know anything about yet, that might come in a hundred years time, that we can't predict, so that they get the message. So they will look back and say, we had better not take on the English because this is what they do to people who commit civilizational crimes against them so that we can use those members of those Islamic rape gangs as a canvas on which we paint the aggression and firmness of our resolve in order to scare off so that the example we set, the example we make of those people, scares off future potential civilizational enemies. And I don't think that would be so hard to do. I think it would simply be a question of going up to the enclaves and saying, you're in miserable circumstances. We supply you with such amenities as you need to sustain life. We're now telling you, you are going to supply this list of named people. And we might not let you repatriate for a little while longer until you do. So you will supply us that list of names. Now, Question number five, when conditions get bad in their areas, then all they will do is come into our areas in roving armed gangs, trying to rob and steal our food and resources. Civil war would result. Well, I think I've answered that one. I'm sure it's quite possible there are quite a lot of foreigners within our land who really would do fantasize about committing raids. And I think the Islamic term is a razia against us 
in order to take our resources and take some of us as slaves. But I, I think fantasy is all it will be. I would, I would expect Muslim areas or foreign areas in general, foreign enclaves within our land, to um, quickly become very um, destitute and self-segregated and cramped, self-segregated and destitute with no access to weapons, no access to material to make weapons, no room to test the weapons and to train in the, those to train with those weapons, effectively to be at the mercy of surrounding English areas that control um, those, those non-English enclaves and provide them with life's necessities. My guess is that in such circumstances, an Islamic enclave will be about as dangerous as a, your privet hedge at pruning time. So, uh, the gentleman provided me with a further question. He called it a bonus question. I don't think our people have enough fit, tough, fighting age males and a penchant for brutal violence the way they do to win a civil law, to, to win a civil war, which I believe will be the outcome of a state collapse. They will use the lack of government and police to try to subjugate us and make us work as slaves for them in order to support them. What then? Well, again, the same old mistake. Uh, uh, it will not... The outcome of a state collapse doesn't mean that we suddenly enter, we the English, enter um, total chaos, post-Holocaust chaos. If we can retain law, i say it again, if we retain law, we retain the ability to uh, live in an orderly society, a functioning society, a society in which people can live together, a society in which people can cooperate, in which people can trade and create value. On the back of that, you can create, you create the means to be able to wage war. And waging war is not just about brawn. It is not about brute force and raw, raw aggression. There are far more valuable things, things that Islamic and foreign enclaves in general simply will not have, the ability to strategize. That's one reason why, apparently, if you do that, that search, uh, why Muslims lose wars, one of the main reasons is that um, Muslim um, societies tend not to be able to coordinate and cooperate. If a functioning English society has that in abundance, the ability to strategize, to coordinate, to communicate, to prepare, to train, to gather intelligence, these things are as important as raw muscle. Training is very is incredibly valuable. It's not the brute force, the size of the biceps of your soldier. It is his ability to train. The training kicks in when the conflict starts. And if we have a functioning society, we can train people to be, to be effective good soldiers. So if we are able to retain law and a functioning society, we will have those qualities in abundance. And I think the other side will not have them at all. As a result, I think it will be easy for us to win. And the question will not be a question of whether they can overtake us and enslave us. The challenge will be making sure that we retain the discipline and the self-discipline to do it humanely so that we do not tarnish our towering moral authority for future generations.